Hello, this is Andrew Womack, and I just wanted to wish all of you a very Merry Christmas. You know, this is a special time of the year, and sometimes it gets overwhelmed and obscured by all of the presents and the parties and everything else, but really, it is to celebrate the advent of the most important thing that ever happened, and that's Jesus becoming a man. Praise God for Jesus. Praise God for Jesus loving us enough that He came and suffered for 33 years, being limited to a physical body, and then suffered on the cross for our salvation, bore our sicknesses. Praise God for Jesus. Man, I just rejoice at this time of the year. And I wanted to wish you a very Merry Christmas to you and all of your family. And praise God, remember that Jesus is the reason for the season. God bless you. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, celebrating the good news of Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. We here at Andrew Womack Ministries want to wish you a very Merry Christmas and a blessed New Year. Welcome to our Christmas Day broadcast of the Gospel Truth. I tell you, what a great day to celebrate the advent of the Lord. This is what I've been talking about for two weeks is out of Luke chapter 2, verse 14, where the angels were singing and praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. And what I've been trying to explain is that that wasn't talking about peace among men as most people interpret it, but rather it's talking about peace from God towards man, that the war between God and man was over. And so I'm offering this book, The War is Over. I've got this little uh, brief introduction to it. This is just a 50-page summary of that whole teaching. We're offering this as a free gift and then a gift for any amount of this. And we've also got study guides, DVDs, CDs, and USBs. And we also have all this material in Spanish. You know, let me just go back to Luke chapter 2, and I've been mainly just picking out verse 14 and talking about when those angels sang glory to God in the highest, but let me read some of this, what is typically called the Christmas story here in Luke chapter 2, and it says in verse 6, And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. Man, there's a lot of messages in this. I'm going to skip through some of this. But, you know, basically people have this intuitive knowledge that they are not all that God wants them to be. And anytime they get the presence of God revealed and it's obvious that they are in the actual presence of God, fear is just a normal reaction because we fear rejection and punishment because we know we don't deserve these things. Praise God. One of the things that the angels were celebrating here was that they said, fear not. Let me just go on and read this. It goes on and says, uh, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy to all people. So instead of us fearing the presence of God, we should always reverence God, but we should not have this terror of rejection and punishment, some kind of a denial from God, because the good news is that Jesus bore all of our sins. This is what I'm going to be talking about all the rest of this week. Today, I've got some other things I'm going to be sharing specifically about the birth of Jesus, but I'm going to be talking about how that the sin situation has been dealt with through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. And because of that, we should have no more fear when we approach God. Or as it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 2, that we should have no more conscience of sin. Did you know that that's something that's wasted on the vast majority of people? Most Christians even believe it's good to have a sin consciousness. They will say things like, I'm an old sinner saved by grace, and they just constantly are identifying with all of their weaknesses and failures. And yet the Scripture says that we should have no more conscience of sin. Sin has been dealt with through the Lord Jesus. Now, I'm talking to people who've accepted the atonement of the Lord. If you haven't yet accepted Jesus and made Him your personal Savior, 
then you, even though your sins have been atoned for and the sacrifice has been made, it doesn't do you any good until you put faith in Jesus and what He did for you. But for those of us who have accepted Jesus, man, the fear should be gone, the terror, the fear of rejection. And so the angel said, Fear not, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Did you know that the word used for Lord right there is the exact same word that is used referring to God the Father throughout the New Testament? So Jesus didn't uh, start as a little baby and grow into God. He was God manifest in the flesh at birth. He was Christ the Lord at His birth. Now, His physical body was human. It was sinless human, but it was human, and it had to grow. It says in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, that Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. His physical body had to grow. His mind had to grow. He didn't come out of the womb speaking Hebrew. He had to learn things, but in His spirit, He was God manifest in the flesh. It goes on to say in verse 12, And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. And this 14th verse is what I've been focusing on for the last two weeks, talking about that this is not peace among men, but it's peace from God towards man. You know, let me just make a couple of comments here. This is a little bit off topic of what I've been saying the last couple of weeks. But seeing as how this is Christmas Day, I just wanted to share this with you. And I'm going to take this from my living commentary. If you all don't know about that, I've, I've spent 40-something uh, years writing commentary notes on the Bible, and I now have 27,000 verses out of the 31,000 verses in the Bible that I've written commentary on. And here's a commentary at Luke chapter 1, verse 5. There was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and uh, her name was Elizabeth. And anyway, the Dead Sea Scrolls, when they found them, did you know that over in the book of uh, Chronicles, it lists David, and David established these 12 courses of priests. Actually, there was 24 courses of priests. They would do a two-week stint each time. And so for the whole year, they rotated, and he listed what, uh, you know, this, the people that were of this course of Abiah when they were supposed to serve. And the Dead Sea Scrolls came out, and they were written uh, before the time of Christ. And, and the Dead Sea Scrolls showed what time this course of Abiah uh, actually functioned in the temple. So Zacharias was of the course of Abiah. And if you, of course, let me just go back and tell you the story in case you don't know, but the angel Gabriel appeared unto Zacharias as he was in the temple doing his duty and told him that he was going to have his wife conceive and bring forth a son. And Elizabeth was well past the age of having children. And so Zacharias actually doubted that this was going to happen, even though he was, a, it was called, he was called a righteous man and that he was blameless. He and, uh, he and Elizabeth were blameless before the Lord. I'm sure they had been praying for children. But it had been so long that when the angel actually told him that his wife was going to conceive and that she was going to have a child, that he just couldn't believe it. And he, uh, he says, how's this going to happen? Uh, seeing that his wife was past childbearing age. And anyway, Gabriel struck him dumb so that he couldn't talk and mess up the whole thing. And when he came out uh, from doing his duty, they perceived that he had seen an angel or something because he was uh, dumb. He was unable to speak and he just gestured to him. And it says that he went home immediately. And if you assume that his wife Elizabeth conceived right away, well then that uh, you can date that because again, the Dead Sea Scrolls say exactly when his course was serving in the temple. And if you go here to Luke uh, chapter 1, when the angel appeared unto Mary, it says in verse... 26, and in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. The sixth month of what? 
Well, the story right before that was all about Elizabeth conceiving, and she was the mother of John the Baptist. And it was the sixth month of her pregnancy that the angel appeared unto Mary and that she conceived. So if you add nine months, the normal time of a child being born to that six months that Elizabeth was in her pregnancy. And if you add all of this up, looking at the time, the course of Abiram served, did you know it comes out to exactly December the 25th? So a lot of people just think that this is an arbitrary date. I've thought that most of my life. And it really doesn't matter to me what day you celebrate because I celebrate the birth of Jesus every single day. And I praise God for what He's done. But I do think it's appropriate to set aside one day to just totally focus on that. And so I just wanted to share this, that these Dead Sea Scrolls have confirmed that December the 25th, I believe, is the accurate day of the birth of the Lord Jesus. Again, that's not a pivotal issue, but I do believe uh, that that is accurate. Let me also share something else that's a misconception about the birth of Jesus. Over here in Matthew chapter 1, you read about the birth of Jesus in verse 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now this is really important, the way this is stated. It says that she was found with child. In other words, it was obvious that she was pregnant. You know, many people think that when the Lord appeared unto Mary that she just immediately went and told Joseph what had happened, but that's not the way it's presented here. It says she was found with child. Let me turn over to Luke chapter 1. I just read that verse there in verse 26 when it says that the angel came to her in the sixth month, and it says in verse 27, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. You know, again, this is the point that I was making earlier, that the angels appeared unto the shepherds and immediately they were afraid and the, sh and the angels said, Fear not. Here is Mary uh, in the very presence of an angel and he told her, he, this is amazing, he says, You are highly favored. Man, what a great greeting. He came and brought blessings, and yet she was troubled at this saying. Again, this is because we have all been raised with the knowledge of our sins. We have an intuitive knowledge according to Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, and we know that we've come short. And every time you see a manifestation of God's presence, people just immediately fear. If this angel would have told Mary something that would have been a rebuke, she probably would have thought this was God. But when she heard something, a blessing, that she was highly favored above all women, she was troubled at that saying. Again, Mary was certainly blessed of the Lord to be able to be chosen to be the one who brought the physical body of Jesus into this earth, but she was a a uh, person herself, contrary to what the Catholic Church teaches, she did not have an immaculate conception. She was a sinner herself. Matter of fact, in this same chapter, when she appeared unto Elizabeth, she said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. She needed a Savior, just like all the rest of us did. After Jesus had started His public ministry, Mary and some of Jesus' uh, you know, half-brothers came and they wanted to see him and he just basically ignored him. And finally, somebody came and said, but your mother and brothers are without. And he looked around and he said, who is my mother or who is my brother? He says, those who do the will of God are my mother and my brother and my sister. And so Jesus uh, did not elevate his mother or his physical brothers, half brothers above other people. And so Mary was a blessed woman, but she was not a sinless woman. She needed a Savior just like anybody else. You can't pray to Mary, and you cannot get any extra pull with Jesus because of you praying to Mary. In verse 30, it says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus." He shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the, th uh, the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. 
Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? You know, sometimes uh, people uh, don't understand that it's okay to ask questions if your question is for the purpose of helping you to understand, not a question of unbelief. In this very chapter, you can turn back to where the angel appeared unto Zacharias, and uh, he just immediately doubted. It says, and let me read this to you in verse... 11. This is Luke chapter 1, verse 11. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. This is the third time in this one chapter that when an angel appears unto people, immediately fear hits them because of their uh, awareness of their sinfulness and their uh, fear that they would have some form of rejection. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And they shall have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord his God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. So here's Zacharias asking a question. But his question wasn't for the purpose of understanding. His was a question of unbelief. He was an old man. His wife was an old woman. And they, it was just impossible for them to have children. So his question was full of unbelief. And look at the angel's response in verse 19, And the angel answered and said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because thou believest not my words which shall be fulfilled in their season. So right here it shows that the angel said you didn't believe. This question was a question of unbelief. And so it's, it depends on why you ask a question. If, you know, the Bible says that, uh, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The works that I do shall ye do also, and greater works than these shall ye do, because I go unto my Father, John chapter 14, verse 12. And if you ask a question to say, God, how can I do this? And it's not that you're doubting that you could do it, but God, show me how. Give me wisdom, how I can start seeing the miraculous power of God work in my life. It's okay to ask that kind of a question, but if you ask a question like, how could this ever happen? How could we do greater works than G Jesus? So yeah, it's a, both of those may be questions, but one was expressing unbelief, the other one was expressing faith. So Mary here, when she says, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? It wasn't a question of doubt. She wasn't doubting God. She was just saying, how is this going to happen? I'm a virgin. I, I'm not married. I've never had sexual relations. Praise God that she asked this question because if she hadn't have asked this question, she was already engaged unto Joseph and it's possible that she might have just supposed that it was going to happen through her union with Joseph and she might have just rushed ahead and tried to uh, think that that was the way it was going to happen. That's what happened with Abraham. When God told him he was going to have a child, he, uh, he and his wife Sarah were unable to have a child for 26 years. And so finally they just decided that they would help God out. And Sarah gave her handmaid, Hagar, to Abraham. And he went in and had sexual relationships with her. And she's the one that birthed Ishmael, the father of all the Arabs. The whole Arab-Israeli conflict that we see today is happening because of somebody trying to get in and figure out and help God bring things to pass. So there's nothing wrong with asking questions if your question is just for clarification. Praise God that she asked, uh, how was it going to happen? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the high shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. You know, I believe that this was probably a huge, huge encouragement to Mary. 
because again, there was nobody that she could relate to. There had never been a virgin birth. There's never been another virgin birth since then. This was just totally outside of the realm of possibility. It would have been a uh, hard thing to believe, and yet um, she did believe, but this would have been an encouragement to go find Elizabeth and find out if her cousin Elizabeth, who was an old woman and well past the age of having children, if she was pregnant, this would be a confirmation that everything that this angel had said to Mary would be true. And so Mary said, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judea. The reason I was reading this was to get to that 39th verse where it says that immediately after the angel had appeared unto her and told her that she would have a child, she immediately went into the hill country to see Elizabeth. And the rest of this chapter talks about when she entered in to greet her cousin Elizabeth. And of course, you got to remember they didn't have communication that we do. They couldn't call on a phone. They couldn't send a telegram. They couldn't text. Uh, they lived miles, probably a day's journey apart from each other. And uh, for her to just go and see Elizabeth, Elizabeth hadn't heard anything. She didn't know any of these things by, in the natural. But immediately when Mary's salutation sounded in her ears, she began to prophesy. She was filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe that's when John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she began to prophesy and say, Whence is it to me that the mother of my Lord should come unto me? She was talking about Mary being pregnant and the mother of the Lord, even though Mary was still a virgin. She didn't know any of these things. This was speaking by the Spirit of the Lord. And the reason I was bringing this out is to say that it, the way it's implied right here, she left immediately to go see Elizabeth. Let me just put it to you this way. If you could imagine that God was to appear to you and tell you that you were going to have a child and yet you had never been married, there was no physical relationship, how would you go tell your fiancé that you are pregnant? But honest, I haven't uh, done anything wrong. The, the Lord came upon me. This is conceived of the Holy Spirit. How would you tell Joseph about that? I think it's just impossible that she could have done this. The way it's implied, it says over in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, that she was found with child uh, by Joseph. And she spent three months with Elizabeth until the birth of John the Baptist. When she came back, she was three months pregnant. She was already displaying that she was pregnant. And that's when Joseph found out about it. I don't believe that she told him about this. How could you tell him? And that's the reason that he was thinking of putting her away privately and divorcing her. But while he slept, the angel Gabriel appeared unto him and told him that this was a supernatural birth and told him that the name of the child would be Jesus. That's the same thing that he told Mary. When they compared his dream with her experience with the angel, it was a confirmation to each other. It helped them to believe. And I believe that if, if, he, if she would have tried to tell him that she had this encounter and that it was the Holy Spirit that impregnated her, well, then... When he had this dream, it would have been easy for him to write it off as she planted these thoughts in me. But because he found her this way, she didn't try and justify herself. She left it up to God to defend her. Then when all of this happened, it was a great confirmation to Joseph and to Mary. And man, that's just awesome. I ran out of time today. But anyway, we've got a lot of things I want to share with you. I've got this little booklet that I'm giving away free of charge, Goodwill Towards Men. And this is a brief summary of this larger teaching, over 200 pages of The War is Over. We also have CDs, DVDs, USB study guide in English and in Spanish. Listen to our announcer. And uh, you can't call today because our phone center is closed, but you can go to our website and receive these materials. Andrew is offering his booklet, Goodwill Toward Men, an introduction to The War is Over, as his free gift to you today. This booklet is available in English or Spanish and is limited to one free booklet per household. This offer is available in the U.S., U.K., Canada, and Australia. Contact us today to receive your free booklet. Once again, I'd like to encourage you to please get these products that we're offering. I wrote this little booklet that is just a 50-page introduction 
to this teaching on the war is over. This little booklet is our free gift to you. We are asking for a donation towards this book. And then we also have CDs, DVDs, and a study guide. And we have this in English and Spanish. So listen to our announcer as he gives you all the detail. And please take advantage of these materials today. Andrew's complete series, The War Is Over, is available in a book or study guide in either English or Spanish. This teaching is also available in a newly updated CD or TV DVD album and as a USB made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources is available when you contact us. Go to our website at awmc.ca to see all the ways you can get these products. Our helpline is closed today to allow our employees to celebrate the holiday, but you can always visit our website at awmc.ca. To write us, use the address on your screen. You know, I believe that my living commentary is probably the greatest contribution I have for the body of Christ. Now through December 31st, you can get Andrew's Living Commentary for 25% off. This Living Commentary is packed with Andrew's footnotes on over 26,000 verses. Don't delay and receive a five booklet bonus bundle. Surprise your loved ones with the enduring joy of the word by going to awmc.ca to get the Living Commentary today. Don't delay, the offer ends December 31st. I want to let you know that we now have a Truth and Liberty live call-in show every weekday and you can tune in from 3.30 to 5 p.m. Mountain Time and we are going to be discussing not only spiritual things but political things, just anything. It's a live call-in. You will actually get put on the air and we will interact with you and I believe it's going to be a blessing to you. So remember that's every weekday from 3.30 to 5 o'clock p.m. for our Truth and Liberty live call-in show. I'd like to let all of you, our Canadian viewers, know that we have a Bible college in Toronto and we would love to have you come and be a part of it. There's multiple ways you can take advantage, not only through the campus there in Toronto, but we have online courses, we have correspondence courses, uh, just a number of ways, but we want to help you and we're making it as available to you as we possibly can. So check it out with the information's on your screen, our Caris Bible College, Toronto. If Andrew's teachings are making a difference in your life, consider becoming a Grace Partner with Andrew Womack Ministries Canada today. Grace Partners are special friends of the ministry who commit to giving $30 or more per month to help Andrew reach thousands of people here in Canada and around the world with a life-changing message of God's unconditional love and grace. If you'd like to become a Grace Partner today, go to awmc.ca. While there, you'll also find details about all of the products available and be able to access many of Andrew's teachings absolutely free. You can listen to them while you're online or download them for later and listen on the go. Remember, that's awmc.ca. Thank you for your support, and we look forward to hearing from you today.